Okay, welcome to Into the Channel podcast, primarily about women's football. Before we hit the pitch, if you enjoy the show or love women's football as much as your boys do, come kick it with us already. Subscribe, follow YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you like to watch or listen at ITC underscore pod on X. I am your host, Dino De Cespedes, and as always, I am joined by my co-host, Mr. Grant Engel. What is up, man? I'm feeling pretty good, buddy. I don't want to get overly philosophical, but I do think it is really important for people to enjoy a journey, not get too hung up on every single result. And even then, sometimes a bad result can kind of catapult you into other good things. So there's my total Instagram post, nonsensical, (laughs) uplifting quote for the day. I feel sick even saying it. A little daily stoic action from, from your boy here. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. So I like it. A little reflection episode. Sounds like you get the uh, the old cerveza getting ready to get cracked. Oh yeah. I'm just I'm just teeing it up. You you go ahead. Yeah. They come to join you. Oh, all right. One of those. Yeah. You know. Got to celebrate. We're we're bidding a couple of our favorite teams adieu. So seems only right. Cheers to uh to all those teams that brought it. And uh, oh, yeah. you know. Left a little mark on this year's Champions League. So with that said, Mr. Grant Angle, where you want to get started? I think there's only one place for us to start this week's program. It's riding triumphantly alongside the Braun Battalion. Let's go. Okay, let's get out of the way, uh, which is a fine result. Barcelona won the second leg quarterfinal match 3-1 at home over Braun. But that doesn't even come close to telling the story of what happened. Braun was obviously a UEFA Women's Champions League debutante, but they not only made it to the quarterfinal... They made it there with relative ease. Like trying to look back and think about this, like and, mm-hmm. you know the whole journey that we've been on. I look back, it was like, yeah, I never really sweated them making the quarterfinal. Mm-hmm. It felt like it was wrapped up pretty quickly. So how did we get here? Opening match, two one win at St. Poulton. I want to say, like even in the pre-show research, like when we decided to do this, we knew we were going to preview the tournament. I knew Braun was going to be fucking rad to to cover at first. Like we identified Gopset pretty early. We thought they were going to be fun to watch, but that 2-1 win over St. Poulton, I thought like okay, I think I'm really going to like this team. Second match, 1-0 win at home over Slavia Praha. They dominated possession and it was our first view of the battalion in live action on television. Mm-hmm. Third match, 3-1 loss at Lyon. I felt like the the stats and scoreline, kind of looking back at them, didn't reflect the story of that match, and we'll always have the Eustin Jelen goal at the 73rd minute. The first surprised look on the face of a Braun player when they score a goal in a big match. Then, fourth match, to bring him to seven points, the 2-2 draw in front of the battalion at Bergen against Lyon. One of the matches of the tournament. Oh, yeah. I feel comfortable saying that. Yep. It's no game, reverse fixture. That one was a Come classic. On. Hell yeah. Um, equalizer at the death, anything you could have asked for. Then what do we have at Slavia Praha in the fifth match of the group stage? One nil win, dominated the ball, punched the ticket to the quarterfinals, a fucking glorious day. Let's go. And then finally, 2-1 win at home versus St. Poulton. Eichland winner at the death. Didn't need to win the match. Already punched the ticket to the quarterfinal, but they won because guts and heart and (laughs) they wanted it more. And I don't know, whatever, whatever sports cliche you want to throw in there. So then Braun used that momentum and we already know what happened just a couple weeks ago. They battled the world's most elite football club to a close 2-1 loss in the first leg. Something that most people outside of Bergen and outside of your boys didn't think was possible. Mm -hmm. But we all knew. We knew what time it was. So I tweeted this from the ITC account, but I just want to say making internet friends with so many bronze supporters has been the highlight of the tournament for me. Oh, yeah. You guys have been unreasonably cool and accepting of us. I'm really grateful that this little podcast has led to us finding a small space in your community, and we're very much looking forward to learning more about it because we have so much more to learn. There's so much history and so so many other like foibles there's something about a frog that I need to uh, to go back and learn about in, in Norwegian slang. So I just want to say, for me, I think I can slightly speak for Dino on this, but thank you, thank you, thank you very much for letting us uh, in the battalion as honorary members. Oh, yeah. Thousand percent cosine. I think there's also some fun parallels between our little show and that squad from Bergen, SK Braun. Hmm. So I jotted a few of these down. Both Braun 
and into the channel podcast, UEFA Women's Champions League debutantes, Cecile reddish Kwame, shocked that she scored against Barca. Your boys equally shocked that our Braun video has been viewed thousands and thousands of times. Uh, DeZone's Camp Hope called two of Braun's matches against Barcelona. DeZone's Camp Hope, two appearances on the ITC during this Champions League run. All right. SK Braun and the Into the Channel podcast, both fully backed, fully, fully backed by the Braun Battalion. Let's fucking go. And I think both the club and the pod have no issues saying this. Saint Jacob says she changed our lives. <laughs> so <laughs> let's go. Yeah, I yeah. guess what I'm getting at here, much like you, I'm thankful that the football gods brought all of us together. And honestly, what more could a couple of American football bros like us ask for? Well, you say we're American football bros. So, of course, uh, one of the prevailing feelings that most Americans have is unfettered greed. So, what more could we have asked for? We could have asked for an incredible upset victory for Braun. But that was not in the cards, uh, and that's okay because Dino and I uh, dislike most greedy Americans anyway. So we can reject that that part that's in our nature. I just think, man, I think we got to talk about Carolina Graham Hansen again. Mm-hmm. CGH is a world beater in this match. Braun had to pretty much throw everything at her just to even kind of kind of limit her impact on the match, and she still had a significant impact on the match. She completed eighty three percent of her passes, even though she didn't score. Four of her five shots were on target. She was a constant source of pressure on Braun's defense, and that freed up Aitana Bonmati to play her typical match and notch the opening goal and an assist on Patry's goal. The only way, I think, I'd be curious to get your opinion on this. The, I, I feel like probably the best way for a massive underdog to even hope to beat or even compete with a giant elite club like this is to play physical, to play organized defense, and then pick their spots when they could be brave on the ball and try to hold possession. I think Braun did that about as well as any club with a significant wage and resource disadvantage could hope to do. Well, CGH, just to rewind real quick, she did the thing again where there's just no beating her to the end line. If she wants that end line, it's hers. She's she's just (laughs) taking it. doesn't matter what you do. And I, I was impressed with Barcelona in this one because... We had some people in the YouTube comments just being like, oh, you're, you're going to see it's going to be 6-1, 7-1, 7-0, you know, talking real crazy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I understand that sentiment, but obviously Braun was not going to allow that. Nope. You know, to your point, the physical play, the resilience, the toughness. I mean, that we knew it was going to be 180 plus minutes of Braun ball, like we like to say. But credit to Barcelona. They played essentially mistake-free football. Mm-hmm. They're like, we're not even going to give you one chance. We're not going to make one dumb decision or one silly back pass or one. We got a shot at a goal or try to get fancy with something. They played technical, clinical, sharp football. And we're like, we don't need to get seven, but we're going to make it impossible for you to overcome this deficit. When we have a chance, we're going to take it. And we're not going to even leave the door a smidge open for this bronze side. Cause I think they knew that that was only going to, you know, and Brian had had their chances, had a couple of really nice moments. They obviously get the goal. DeZone will work on our technical, <laughs> technical difficulty issues. Still love you DeZone. Yeah. Shout out to DeZone for sure. But tough moment over here in the U S and apparently in other spots as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, our guy can't hope, you know, trying to call that one live. Um, I did uncover a stat that I thought was very telling and apologies for all the math, but I feel like these numbers really do tell the story of the tie and perhaps of some of like Barcelona's game plan, but also their frustrations. So in 26 league F matches this season, Barcelona's put 39.82% of their shots on target. And in an incredible bit of symmetry, they've converted the exact same 39.82 of those shots on target into goals. I checked this math like five times. It's <laughs> it, it's like it's almost like the team is like running off an algorithm at this point. It's pretty it's kind of spooky, kind of disturbing, but it is what it is. So for the purpose of this exercise, let's let's round up and say 40% of their shots are on target. 40% of those shots on target become goals. Against Braun, their shots on target rate dips from 40 to 34. Mm. So Braun making it a little bit tougher to put a shot on target. And then instead of cashing in on 40% of their shots on target, like they do in Liga F, Barca was only able to convert 25% into goals against Braun. Mm. So those numbers, I think, tell a really interesting story, you know, because we also saw in the comments too, people were like, oh, well, we got so many shots. We got like 30 shots or 20 something shots or whatever. Uh, you know, on a normal day, you know, those become goals. But I think one, th- one thing that we've learned is against Braun, there is no normal day. Nope. <laughs> like, it's going to be a hard day, however way you slice it. Credit to Braun's defense for that, their tenacity, and that difference maker and goal, Aurora Mikkelsen, mm-hmm. really kept them in it. 
180 plus minutes to be proud of. But again, you know, I, th- I think credit to both of these sides. We got a great couple of performances from Braun and a great couple of performances from Barcelona. And then obviously the the more talented, the deeper team, the more experienced team kind of wins out. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, that's that data there is really, really interesting because we have talked about like in close matches or we talk about like managerial advantages that one squad might have. You're really just trying to chip away at that margin for error with your opponent. So I think that really does tell a really interesting story going from converting. I mean, just converting 40% of your shots on goal is just ridiculous anyway. But Braun being able to cut that down to 25%, that is that is a significant data point. So I'm, I appreciate you bringing that up. Yeah, quick follow-up on that. So they managed 20 shots on target over the two matches, five goals. Mm. Now, if they would have been at their 40%, that five goals becomes eight goals. Yep. So that's what the people were expecting. They're like, well, 20, shot, you know, 20 shots on target, that should be eight goals against Braun. It's five goals because obviously Braun's going to be a little bit of a tougher customer than some of the League F competition. Damn right. Hey, um, that League F take, by the way, it's aging. It's aging nicely. It's looking real Jeff Goldblum-like, my good man. Mm-hmm. I like it. Yeah. You know, just <laughs> add a little spice to it. Let it simmer on the pot. You know, I'm starting to get some of those aromas and it's going to be a nice tasty dish in the next uh, couple weeks here. Aging with grace for sure. Um I want to get to a couple uh, nice brawn moments uh, from the match. In the 21st minute, a ball gets played over, and Senia Galpset absolutely shrugs Mariona Caldente right off her. Just a big get off this, mm. just with one shoulder. Hits a low shot from an acute angle. It was a relatively easy save for Katakoi, but still just the strength from, again, the teenage Senia Galpset really kind of making sure we didn't leave this tournament without one more of those type of moments. Speaking of Caldente, she had a run pretty much in on goal. Stenovic steps right in front of her and had like a crucial intervention there to just pop the ball away from her. I thought that was a great look from Stenovic, who really, you know, the tallest of tall tasks for all the defenders uh, in this match for Braun. I, I mean, they held up, as you pointed out, as well as they could. And then, okay, we can't get out of here without talking about the goal. But as Dino referenced earlier, so in the United States of America, the stream of the match froze for like 25 seconds. And the 25 seconds it froze were exactly when Senia Galpset plays that perfect pass to Svendheim, who sneaks the ball off the post into the net to pull one back. The stream freezes. I'm sitting there. I'm like, that's unfortunate. I don't like that. It comes back in that about 25 to 30 seconds, <laughs> and it's showing the replay of the goal. Our guy, Cam Pope, just the classiest, most professional dude you could think of. I didn't even put together that he's broadcasting you know, from a studio in Manchester. And so the stream for him froze too. So for this dude who's broadcasting a live Champions League match, loses the feed, it comes back he has to immediately process, oh, no big deal. A fucking goal has been scored by the <laughs> massive underdog. And it was just total confusion on this side and, as you mentioned, other sides of the pond. Yeah. Conspiracy? <laughs> I'm not going to go that far. But uh, I don't know. Maybe they don't want us to be winning out here. I did want to give um, <laughs> Barcelona some props in this one. Aitana Bonmati, obviously the tie is within one goal. Mm-hmm. You know, So that, that very next goal, that first goal in the second leg, is crucial yeah and i don't want to say barcelona wasn't you know i think they, they were having some success but that bomati goal was just like this is oh this is done now like yep. i'm going to i'm going to put this out of reach right now and i'm going to keep working for the rest of the match to continue to put it further and further out of reach i thought she was great yep. caldente she had some chances she couldn't cash in on but i mean she kept obviously pushing getting herself into good position uh, CGH, who you mentioned. I think Katakoi, I think we have to get her into that short list of players that just do not get rattled when the ball's in play. Mm-hmm. Just as cool a customer as can be. Like, just like the ball's been, she's like, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll scoot over there and just grab it. It's, it's no problem. I know you're sprinting dead on onto it. She's just so fucking cool and goal. And I think, like, when she gets beat, she's like, hmm, all right, that's not going to happen again. Um, <laughs> I, I thought this was, like I said, one of the more impressive Barcelona showings. I think this season since I've been watching them, because again, they didn't, they didn't pour it on. They weren't overwhelming, but they played almost perfect football, Mm -hmm. you know, and they get, they get beat, 
because Senior Gopset drops an absolute dime right into right, like, you know, like just into the one spot that was going to make Barcelona vulnerable. But also if you're Barca, you know that they're not going to be able to do that two times, three times, four times in a match. Right. So again, credit to them. I think this was one of their more impressive performances. I think it's totally fair. And I think, you know, not to always view everything through the Braun lens, but I think that's even more impressive for Braun. You totally nailed it, is that they made Barcelona have to play a great match. And Barcelona doesn't have to always play a great match to beat the hell out of you. And so, like you said, though, I mean, those elite, super elite, hyper elite players that Barcelona has, they showed up and, and knew that they had to play at that level. And they did it because, you know, that's who they are and that's and that's what they do. Ultimately, I just want like to just to go back to it. I mean, this is a Braun podcast. Who are we fooling here? Um, <laughs> this just this cannot be looked at as anything other than an unassailable triumph for Braun and its supporters. I was really psyched to see our pals in Norway kind of reveling in the joy of the journey. Uh, and I'll say this, if I may be so bold as to be the American spokesperson on behalf of the battalion. We're not looking at this as some kind of cute season of a lifetime story. This club has young, excellent players. This club has an excellent manager. Mm -hmm. They've shown an interest as a club in acquiring more talent. This might be the end of Braun's 2024 UEFA Mafia Women's Champions League, but this is the beginning (laughs) of a new era for our club. We'll be fucking back. 1000%. It's not going to be in next Champions League, unfortunately. We'll have to wait. We'll have to wait a cycle, but that's okay. We've got some uh, domestic <laughs> action that we'll we'll definitely be tuned in on. Um, I appreciate you trying to pull some strings behind closed doors to see could we arrange some coverage here in the U.S. Um, we'll keep you guys posted on that. Coming up, though, we're going to talk through the other three UEFA Women's Champions League quarterfinal matchups: PSG, BK, Hacken, Chelsea, who will face this Barcelona side. Getting past Ajax and Lyon and Benfica, we're also going to share some early thoughts on the Champions League semifinal matchups. So you're not going to want to miss those. Like if you liked and subscribe if you enjoyed talking a little Champions League football with your boys. Come on, Cam. You know we're talking to you, buddy. You know the right people at DAZN. We got to make this happen. We got to get top Syrian on DAZN. Uh, I won't put too much pressure on you right away. I know you got other matches to call, but, you know, keep it in mind, buddy. And with top Syrian in mind, the battalion rides again, April 13th against Lynn. We'll find a way to keep on rocking with you guys even before the matches are broadcasted over here. And seriously, to the battalion, one more time. Tusen tak. All right, let's scoot ahead. Chelsea versus Ajax, Stamford Bridge. Where do you want to get started with this one? It's been a hell of a ride, Amsterdam. Shout out to you, Dino, for recognizing how fun and cool this club is back in the group stage. Uh, when you were locked in on the group of life, you, t- you turned me into a quick convert, along with our guy Dan, of course. And it was such a fun and interesting road for them to even qualify uh, for the quarterfinals. So I'm going to do this uh, quickly here. In the group stage, Ajax's six matches looked like this. 2-0 win at home versus PSG. That win looks more and more impressive as the weeks go on. Mm-hmm. Then a 3-0 loss at Roma. Valentina Giacinti brace in that one. Then a 1-1 draw at Bayern Munich. And then we start to turn it around a little bit. 1-0 win at home versus Bayern. But then the setback, 3-1 loss at PSG. Katoto gets a brace in that one. Then what does Ajax have to do? They got to come in there. They, they got to win, you know, to even really have a shot at kind of controlling their own destiny. 2-1 win at home versus Roma. There's an own goal by Roma in the 84th that Ajax forced. Sends them to the quarterfinals. As I mentioned a moment ago, you were rocking with this team from the start of our coverage when you landed on Group C and you presciently named it the Group of Life. What's your takeaway from your time watching Ajax these past few months? Yeah, you're you're, uh, rehashing some great memories of that match day six in the group stage when all four teams, Bayern, Roma, PSG, and Ajax in the group of life, at different points of the match, were in the quarterfinals (laughs) and just got 90 plus minutes of shuffling. That was a wild, wild day. I think this team's really close, man. Very much on the path to joining the upper crust of European football. I'm going to go through some names here. Regina Van Eyck, Romé Lukter. Chastity Grant, Lily Johannes, Issa Cardinal, Melissa Kaiser, Lota Kukular, all seven of those players, 23 or under. Lily Johannes, mm. still just 16 years old. Issa Cardinal just turned 19, I think maybe yesterday. Happy birthday, oh. by the way, Issa. 
a uh, 23-year-old Romy Luchter, who I talked about as a potential quarterfinal X factor, I'm definitely feeling validated about that take. Two matches against Chelsea, six shots, three on target, no goals though, but so, so super close on a couple of those that who knows, maybe turn this into a different kind of tie. And I think very emblematic of where Ajax is, like kind of close, knocking on the door, dangerous, but not quite all the way there yet. A couple plays here, a couple plays there, maybe a year or two away. Uh, and they might be in that top tier of European football, like I mentioned. And I'm glad that you went through their road to the quarterfinals because this is a team that, like you mentioned, they beat Champions League semifinalist PSG 2-0. Mm-hmm. They beat Roma. They beat Bayern. They notched a draw at Bayern, you know, to reach the quarterfinals. So that's that's a gauntlet, man. Like that's like, oh, yeah. like you, you have to be a legit, legit team to kind of string together those results. And then it was kind of unfortunate. Obviously, Spitza misses the first match. Lily gets the yellow card in the first match, misses the second match. And yep. even still kind of felt like they were, you know, a couple of ball rolls of the ball, a couple of bounces away from, from making this one really, really interesting. And last note, you already know the supernova, Lily Johannes, for long stretches, Ajax is the best player. For a club to find a talent like her, to develop a talent like her, to instill a footballing philosophy, provide a player like that in an environment where somebody could thrive. Like, how could you not be optimistic about Ajax's future? In addition to just kind of like where they are right now, like they're a legit team. It takes a lot to get to the final eight of the Champions League yeah. and still so much growth potential with the squad as well. You have to be optimistic about their future. I think mm-hmm. you're spot on there. I mean, Ajax as a brand is one of the most famous clubs in the world. They're in a famously and wonderfully metropolitan city. They've clearly been smashing their recruiting and development. And now they have Champions League experience. Mm. As I say, every every time we do this podcast, Dino and I, we like grew up on the NBA in, in America. And even Pep talked about, Pep Guardiola talked about this, about the Manchester City men's side, about climbing the hill of the Champions League. You have to get that experience first. You're never going to walk into a tournament like that in the first time and make the final. Uh, or very rarely you are. You have to kind of get that experience. So this this just could not be more huge for the development of all those young footballers that you mentioned. There's no way, and I know this is this is the positivity podcast, and it should be because this all of these these are positive steps for these clubs. This is an again, I'll use the term. This is an unassailable triumph for the IX Women's Football Club. Yeah, thousand percent. They they did roll the ball out Stanford Bridge. <laughs> what'd you see? What'd you see in that match? So Ajax walked into the match knowing they had a monumental task ahead of them. You know, just get out in front of Chelsea, the four-time defending WSL champions, <laughs> make up for the 3-0 defeat in the first leg. Um, so that was obviously a long shot. But I just want to say, in the second minute, a Swedish goalkeeper is Ashir Musevich, who I have a feeling we're going to discuss a few times in this episode, uh, had a wild giveaway mm-hmm. where she basically just passed the ball directly to Chastity Grant, who was clearly caught... She, Grant was caught off guard by how direct the pass was to her. And I loved the commentary from Chris Sharples, who has a great commentator voice, by the way, has been awesome to listen to throughout this tournament, yep. who just goes, goodness me, <laughs> when, when Musa Fish gets the ball to Grant. Um, Nailed it. Grant then gave the ball over to midfielder Nadine Nordham, who crossed the ball in to Jonah Vandeveld, but it was slightly overcooked and Vandeveld missed the one-timer and Chelsea was able to escape the danger. But like you said about these kind of sliding doors or like if a couple chances go a different way, especially in the first match, obviously, it's harder to make that argument when you're already down 3-0. But I don't know. Things get weird when somebody scores in the first three minutes of a match. Oh, yeah. And a couple more really, really interesting chances. Um, Lukter had a, a great look at goal at the 17th minute, just wide. Had Musevich beat for sure. Yeah. And then another Musevich, uh, you know, wacky wild play <laughs> She she gets her ball deflected off Tini Ukstra. I always like to marvel at when time slows down mm-hmm. in these matches, when you're just like, there's nothing anyone can do. You just all are watching the ball as a footballing <laughs> global community. Uh, that ball felt like it took a minute and a half to just, just miss breaking through for Ajax. Those two chances, once both come and go, mm. you know, now you're like, oh man, now we need like five goals to like actually make up this entire uh, deficit. I'm totally with you that like when the second one doesn't trickle in, it's like, okay, Chelsea's luck is looking pretty good in this one. I did think it was very interesting though that Muzovic had a grin on her face after that happened. But I think you're right. At that point, it looked like it wasn't going to happen for Ajax. Uh, Let's fast forward 33rd minute. Aaron Cuthbert wins the ball in the middle of the field. Stop me if you've heard that one before. 
Uh, she then gives the ball to Girl Wrighton, who delivers an easy pass to Myra Ramirez. Ramirez hits it through the legs of Van Eyck. And from there, the dream is over for Ajax. But again, still a triumph to even make it this far. Yeah, totally. This one slammed the door shut on the tie. And it wasn't just the Ramirez goal. You know, Chelsea also started this one with so much firepower on the bench. Yep. Lauren James, Shuka Nuskin, Joanna Canarud, Kat Macario, all available, all ready to enter the chat if needed. Myra Ramirez, though, props to her. She opens her Champions League account for the Blues. And at this point, pretty much cruise control to the semis uh, for this Chelsea side. Yeah, absolutely. They set themselves up for that in the first leg by getting a 3-0 uh, win in Amsterdam. Mm-hmm. couple quick moments in the second half. There was a great exchange between Kaylee DeSanders, who made a perfectly timed slide tackle running along Myra Ramirez in the penalty area to essentially stop a 1v1 with Van Eyck. Uh, Ramirez gets the ball back, though, and then she nutmegs DeSanders. Uh, to get a little payback. I love that kind of like interchange. That's like straight up and one street ball type stuff. And then I would obviously be remiss if I did not mention uh, that in the 65th minute, DeSanders gets the ball to Teeny Hoekstra, who pushes the ball probably 30 or 40 yards, which is a teeny special, Mm -hmm. her just driving the ball down the field. She takes it about 40 yards, delivers an excellent through ball to Chastity Grant, who manages to outstride Ashley Lawrence, no small task there, and get it past Musevich. 1-1 in the match, 4-1 on aggregate. A nice moment for Ajax. Yeah, well-deserved goal. They definitely deserve one. Hell yeah. Grant definitely deserved one. I thought she was rock solid. Oh, yeah. Pretty much the whole champion. <laughs> pretty much the whole champion. Like, I don't think we had one negative thing to say about her uh, and her performance. So I'm really glad that she was able to break through in this one. Absolutely. And Musevic, uh, we talked about her earlier. A couple of kind of weird moments for her. Took it in stride. She made a pair of diving saves, one denying Luke during the 80th minute after Luke put a great move on Jess Carter to get free. And then another diving save over uh, Lotte Kukular when she fired on goal in the 88th minute. Mm-hmm. In both cases, Musevic got up with that same kind of wry smile that she had after the near disasters that she had early in the match. I like that mentality from a goalkeeper. I think you need to be a little... I use this term loosely, but I, I talk about Ederson for my uh, men's club. You see Mary Earps for Manchester United and, and for the English national team, who's very famous for just the camera being on her and her screaming fuck off. You need your goalkeeper to be like 27% unhinged. So I like that from Musa. <laughs> I love that. Very data heavy podcast today. I, I'm, I'm way into it. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the semis. You know, obviously Chelsea. They took care of business in Amsterdam, if we're going to be honest. And I think, like, tough to kind of tough to judge this Chelsea performance just because I don't think we've seen this lineup before. Total hodgepodge. You know, yeah. Frank Kirby's in there. No LJ, no, Can- you know, and like Canner is like a, obviously one of those key pieces. It seems like she's always there. New skin who was out of her mind in Amsterdam. <laughs> she's just like, yeah. uh, not in the starting lineup in this one. But if I'm projecting forward, I want to have a little Barca Chelsea, a little mini preview here. Oh, yeah. I think Chelsea's got the firepower. To keep up with anyone. Obviously, Barcelona got some firepower of their own. I mentioned prior to the quarterfinals that I wasn't sure about the Chelsea defense and back line. Thought they 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 might have been a little vulnerable. And I think Ajax was able to make some progress on Chelsea's defense. Mm. Uh, what, it's kind of like once you get past the midfield, it just feels like there's always like a lot of space back there. And it could just be that Chelsea's like committing a lot of offense up front which is maybe leaving leaving a lot of space uh, behind. Obviously, that game plan is going to have to change against Barcelona. I think if I had to project, even though you know we're going to come back with a proper semifinals preview, I kind of envision a really high-scoring back-and-forth kind of affair because if Barcelona is going to attack Chelsea's defense, I kind of like Chelsea on the counter. You know, when mm. you have like Wrighton, Canarud, LJ, you know, maybe Kat Macario's in there. And now, and, and you know, Aaron Cuthbert, new skin that we talked about, like mm-hmm. they're a little bit scary when they got a little bit extra space. And you know, Barcelona likes to commit a lot of personnel forward. So I'm kind of hoping that we see a lot of firepower both directions, high scoring. And I don't know what, when, when you play that, that kind of tie, well, those can kind of go either way. Although I think Barcelona, a slight edge based on what we've seen. Sure. I think that's totally fair. I think a, a high scoring semifinal with obviously the edge to Barcelona, I think that seems like the most likely outcome. You talk about getting out on the counter and then you just rattle off six awesome <laughs> players. I don't even think in that group, I know you mentioned her earlier, you didn't even mention Fran Kirby in that group. And then the fact that the people who can actually help get the counter started could be Kadisha Buchanan or Ashley Lawrence. So, mm-hmm. I mean, just stacked to the nines. And you know, I got to say it. The Lioness captain 
Millie, Millie, Millie. Millie Bright, last I heard, so March 7th, Emma Hayes gave a comment, said that Millie was playing some 11-on-11 in training. She wasn't Mm. quite ready uh, those few weeks ago to come in off the bench, quote, but she's not far away, uh, end quote. I would say, though, I would be maybe a little hesitant. I would hope that she could get some uh, WSL games under her belt uh, because I don't think coming back from a layoff of an injury, maybe being thrown up against Barcelona, not a great strategy. I'm guessing Emma Hayes has already considered that, though. Yeah, I think she would definitely be a difference maker here just because so smart, physical as well. And good call on Lawrence. I think it's going to be very telling how we see Ashley Lawrence playing against Barcelona. Mm-hmm. You know, I think she's sort of like the the linchpin with regard to like, okay, are they playing more offensive style? Is she, is she kind of sitting back more? Obviously, she could do both. Yeah. You got to imagine that defensively, they might need as uh, as much personnel as they can get back there. Uh, but ultimately, really excited for this semifinal clash. It's going to be a classic. So obviously, we've talked about Braun Bergen, number one stop on the list. You know, we'll get to London eventually. I know you and I have both uh, been there a few times. Amsterdam. For an Ajax match. Safe to say. I think that's the ITC kind of vibes out there in Amsterdam. I like to think that the city of Seattle uh, looks to Amsterdam in several different ways as a bit of an inspiration. So, uh, yeah, looking to get out there to catch it. Again, congrats to Amsterdam on an amazing run. Congrats to you, Dan. Shout out to you, my guy. Congrats to Lily. We will see you guys soon as we continue to follow you on the club circuit. Uh, And maybe some on the international circuit, too. Who knows? And speaking of... European cities and European markets that your boys might have to swing by. Here's another couple, Lyon and that team from Lisboa, Benfica. Hell of a journey to make it this far. This is a club that we've been rocking with since day one of the group stage. Let's quickly recap how Benfica got here further than any team in the history of Portuguese women's football, by the way. Let's fucking go. Benfica opened the group stage on the wrong end of a 5-0 drubbing at the hands of Barcelona. Nice bounce back win, 1-0 at home versus Rosengard. One no win at home over Eintracht Frankfurt. And this was the big one. A massive 1-1 draw in the reverse fixture at Frankfurt. Gigantic Nicole equalizer in the 71st. Basically puts them on the fast track to the quarterfinal. And Benfica wrap up second place in Group A with a 2-2 draw at Rosengard. And an unforgettable 4-4 draw at home versus Barcelona. Mm. Shout out again to our guy Campo with the unforgettable call on that one. Another instant classic. My question, what will you take away from Benfica's historic run to the quarterfinals? And not just like reaching the quarterfinals, because while this tie ended with a somewhat, not somewhat, with a very misleading scoreline, it's worth noting Benfica and Lyon separated by just one goal for more than half the match. So they were in striking distance for almost 50 minutes, maybe maybe even more than 50 minutes. I could go back and double check my math. What are you going to remember about this special, special Benfica Champions League run? I'm going to side many things, but I'm going to side with, I'm going to remember them for their balance despite being a relative infant in women's football, Mm. there's not a reason that this club should have so many good players in the attack and on defense for where they are kind of in their journey. The, The club was founded in 2017 on the women's side, and they're already here playing like this against an elite, super elite team like Lyon. Obviously, Kika, Marie Aladou, Lucia Alves, Nicole Andrea Faria, Jessica Silva, Chrissy Ushebe, and then in goal, Lena Powells. I mean, we're talking about a squad already here, man. And I talked about yeah. with Ajax, you have an established brand. You're just kind of overlaying that brand and that system and your style. You're overlaying that into the women's game, and it's already working for them. I'm going to be selfish. I'm going to pick one more thing, one more like flashbulb. It's the 4-4 draw versus Barcelona in front of their home fans. Like. Yeah. That was as riveting of a football match as we've seen in the tournament so far. I think the 4-4 draw versus Barcelona and bronze 2-2 draw versus Lyon and even bronze 2-1 loss to Barcelona, I think those are probably – I might be forgetting one, but those are like three of my absolute favorite matches in the tournament so far. And to come back and draw Barcelona 4-4, when you're down 2-0 and you know Barcelona is always capable of beating you 7-0 – Coming back to draw that 4-4 is just bonkers. Yeah, it wasn't quite 
you know, the nil-nil or the one-one. I think we saw Chelsea and Hacken go nil-nil, which was impressive. Mm, it was a great one, yeah. I mean, that one was very, very fun. But 4-4 four, four against Barcelona, <laughs> that's just yeah. a slugfest. <laughs> like a, an awesome. epic one at that. I think I'm going to remember this team's fight mm. and their spirit. I mean, I definitely agree with you, though, with regard to like the depth of this roster yeah. and the production that they got up and down. Like you mentioned, Kika Nazareth, huge and huge spots. Tremendous worldy of a dime to create Benfica's lone goal at Lyon, by the way, to pull them back again within striking distance. Group stage and quarterfinal goals from Marie Alidou, Jessica Silva, Nico Reisla, Andrea Faria, and the aforementioned Kika. And whoever's picking the squad in Canada that decided that Marie Alidou is not good enough to be like, that person needs to go, go log on to Indeed and find something else to do professionally because that is an Yo. embarrassment. Shout out to uh, She Scores Bangers at She Scores Bangers on Twitter who is writing about this. Read it. Watch her content. She Scores Bangers, absolute uh, amazing <laughs> women's football stuff. 100% cosign, one of my favorite um, watches and reads. I'm, I'm not going to front. I don't read it, but I do watch She Scores there Bangers content. Very high quality. <laughs> Keep it going, She Scores Bangers. Lucia Alvish, she was an assist machine, real difference maker till the very end. Christy Ushabi, huge anchoring the defense. She didn't play in that 5-0 drubbing against Barcelona, and I think it definitely showed. Lena Powell's, who you mentioned, tremendous as well. Somebody get Lena Powell's a spa day. She definitely deserves it. I want to switch gears, though, talk a little bit about this Lyon side. We've been doing a lot of celebrating of the teams that we're going to bid farewell to with good reason. I think we love all of them for different reasons. Uh, but Lyon, what was your biggest takeaway from watching this side put the squeeze on our beloved Benfica and advance, I think, fairly comfortably into the semifinal? Definitely. Com- when they got away with the 2-1 victory in Lisbon, I think it became fairly comfortable. Um, I think that's a fair way to frame it. When I looked at this question that you wrote in the doc, I literally Googled, quote, how dangerous is a boa constrictor's bite? <laughs> um, and it turns out that a large boa has a bite that will really mess you up. It's not a venomous snake, but it's not going to feel great. And it has like these weirdly shaped teeth. And uh, you're probably going to need to go to a hospital. So why did I Google that? One, because I'm a madman. But two, because we know that Leon can quick strike you early in the match and cause severe damage. Mm -hmm. Uh, We always joke they're, they're on a mission to score within five minutes of every match that they play. And we know they're prone to do that. But ultimately, what I think gets you with this Leon side is just the sheer number of chances they create. I'm going to really beat the hell out of this boa constrictor uh, analogy here. <laughs> but in the typical uh, metaphor for a team that squeezes you to death is like a defensive-minded team. But follow me on this one. The combination or some combination of Diani, Hegeberg, Le Sommer, Lindsay Horan, Daniela Vandedonk, Sarah Debritz, Amel Majri, Vicky Besho, Selma Basha – are going to just possess the ball for long stretches on your side of the pitch. You're going to struggle to clear the ball because they're going to press the hell out of you. And your clearances are often going to end up to their back line and they're going to come at you again. And from there, the snake squeezes and squeezes and squeezes. And eventually, more often than not, everything fades to black. You succumb to the pressure and you look up and you're down 3 nil in the 47th minute. And there's really nowhere to go. And oh, by the way, speaking of that back line that ends up with the ball, they've been without Wendy Renard for a while. Mm -hmm. So there's a chance that they could add one of the greatest players who's ever lived to the roster here shortly. I mean, incredible list of um, Lyon attacking just forces of nature that you mentioned. And you skipped one. (laughs) One Delphine Cascarino. Oh, yeah. Oh, geez. (laughs) It's an absolute game breaker in this tie. (laughs) Before this quarterfinal tie, just 25 goals for Delphine in 161 matches played for Lyon. That's one goal every 6.44 games of Cascarino's Lyon career. She obviously suffers the catastrophic knee injury. Safe to say she's worked her way back and then some. She scored three of Lyon's six goals against Benfica in just 165 minutes of action. Not even two full matches. She's on a mission, probably playing some of the best football of her career. Uh, I think it's worth noting again, she didn't appear in the group stage. So it's not just DNE, Hegeberg, Lesselmeyer, Bosch, all those players that you mentioned. You now have Cascarino to worry about, to deal with, to game plan for. We're going to talk about Leon's semifinal opponent coming up here in a minute. But where are your expectations right now with regard to this Leon side? I can tell you that 
Lyon's expectations, I can say this without any real reporting, their expectation is that they're going to win the UEFA Women's Champions League. Mm. And they should feel that way. Now, I do believe they're in for a hell of a fight. And that is my expectation. I think that other squad that we're going to talk about is not going to lay down by any stretch of the imagination. But if you're Lyon and you're a Lyon supporter, at the risk of sounding biased in any way, I feel like Lyon supporters should say, we're winning this thing. It's our time now. Yeah, it's our time now again. Wendy yeah. <laughs> Renard, obviously looming, dangerously looming to mm-hmm. you know, pull it a little heat parlance, but they're coming up against a team that got a little swag to them. So the, these semis are going to be very, very interesting. We're going to scoot ahead to that one in just a minute. We've shouted out all of our two seeds on the way out of the Champions League, and I don't think this team from Gothenburg deserves any less. Yeah. Tremendous run through the group stage against harsh competition. Let's rewind all the way back to qualifying where Hacken had to beat the team currently leading the Dutch league, FC Twente, in a home-and-home. Home. Check this out. Hacken draws Twente at home mm. and then travels to the Netherlands and beats Twente 2-1 to one away to make Let's the go. group stage. Just one loss in six group stage matches for this Hacken side, and that came at Stamford Bridge. Tough place to win. Two wins over Real Madrid. Let that sink in. Hacken beat Real Madrid twice. <laughs> a win and a draw against a super tough Paris FC team and a draw against Chelsea in Sweden. That is a no bullshit run right there. Ultimately, I think this hack inside kind of ran out of gas and was definitely, definitely outgunned by a PSG side that outshot BK Hacken over the two legs, 36 to 15, 17 to seven in terms of shots on target Mm. and PSG advances five to one on aggregate. Props to Hacken though for being super game till the very end. PSG though, they haven't lost since November. It's been four plus months <laughs> since they were beaten 1-0 at Bayern in the Group C, Group of Life, Group Stage. Six wins in a row now for PSG in all competitions. Could have been seven, but you might remember they had that super unlucky draw at Lyon when Dale made a knock in an own goal very, very, very late in that one. Tremendous chance coming up, though, for some PSG redemption when these two sides meet again. Oh, in the Champions League semifinals. Let's fucking go. <laughs> oh, that was a lot. How do we even begin to unpack uh, what's coming up here? Before we get to the big stakes in the semifinal, let me echo the sentiment on Hacken. The umlaut queens, as I may start to call them, hold the A button and then press number four. That's how you get the umlaut <laughs> on the uh, on the keyboard when you're tweeting or talking about this squad. Respect the name, respect the culture, include the umlaut. Um, I want to say the names of these five players one more time. Katarina Kosola, Yusufine Rebrink, Ivy Luke, Elma Juntela Nelhag and Jennifer Falk. What a fantastic back four and keeper combination. Mm -hmm. This team went to London and got a nil-nil draw out of Chelsea Football Club at Stamford Bridge Mm. when Sam Kerr was in the side. (laughs) Shout to them. I plan on seeing them again and again in this tournament as we continue to watch over the years. As for PSG, they're seven points back of Lyon and D1F, but I want to throw this at you. PSG is good enough to finish second in any league in the world. And I don't think it's a stretch to say they would be super live to win pretty much any league in the world, except maybe the league they're in and Liga (laughs) F. And even then, I wouldn't count them out. But I think PSG has vaulted themselves. If you just look at the sheer talent from goalkeeper to number nine, I think this is one of the absolute best teams in the world. Yeah, I mean... Watching this PSG side and the form that they're in now, mm. you know, I feel like if they can start this D1F season again today, I feel yeah. like it'd be it'd be totally different. Obviously, we talked about like that Lyon match at Lyon was so huge yeah. because PSG threw the kitchen sink, the refrigerator, the washing machine. They threw everything <laughs> at that match. And to have a win kind of plucked away at the very end, just the most unfortunate of bounces. I kind of feel like that's going to supercharge this PSG side even more yep. into the semifinal matchup. For sure, the way they're playing now, absolutely they're they're good enough to be top 2 in any league in the world. Yeah. I did want to mention one other quick thing. Someone in our mm-hmm. comment section chimed in about getting a little shook seeing how easily Spain beat France in the Nations League final. And obviously, I know Tabitha Chuinga is from Malawi, but she's such a huge piece of the PSG offense. You kind of think of her as a French player. Um, <laughs> I kind of weirdly feel like if she was on that France Nations League team, I don't know. That would be that. That would be a little different. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I love Katoto, but you know she's not the straight up Tyreek Hill level burner that Chewinga is. Katoto obviously deadly from within range. 
which we saw in this one. She notched PSG's third goal, slamming the door on Hacken completely shut. But yeah, I think Chewinga is kind of, I mean, we've marveled at her through the entire group of life, right? But she's now, I think, elevated herself to probably PSG's most important player. Like she's an absolute game breaker. And it's not just in the open field. Like she's just like, oh, little crevice and, I, and I've got it. And it always feels like Chewinga has a good game and Baltimore as well. Or Chewinga has a good game and, you know, Corbin Albert or Marie Antoinette Cototo or Kashawi. Like, you know, but it's Chewinga so fucking steady that like you just kind of wonder what's that going to look like? And I did make a mental note. Wendy Renard is such a linchpin in this semifinal matchup mm-hmm. because I'm not sure whose spot she's going to get. But safe to say, Vanessa Gilles, that that spot in Lyon's defense, a little bit vulnerable, a little bit shaky. If I'm yes. game planning, I think it's a very different type of approach. So I don't know, man. Like the wind could be blowing Paris's way uh, in the semifinal matchup. But again, we just talked Lyon pretty much in depth, and they look so good as well. This one's going to be pay per view for sure. 100%. And Renard was on the bench in the last match. So she was available to play. I don't know what if what kind of signal that was, if that was just a look they just wanted to give. But I mean, I think from most managers' perspective, I'm not putting you on the bench unless I think you can give me at least 10 minutes. So if that's where Renard is in her recovery, then I think that's very exciting for Leon. Let me posit this to you. We're talking about Chewinga. Chewinga often plays on the attacking left. I would expect her to do the same. That would mean that she'll be going up against Leon's right back, who is Ellie Carpenter. So I want to propose this. Before the match, we have a 40-yard dash no. between, no. No. <laughs> between Chewinga and Carpenter, and that determines who gets to kick off. And then, post-match, we should do a 100-yard dash between Chewinga and Carpenter, and the winner... Their team gets an extra 0.5 goal added to the aggregate score. Because you're talking about pay per view, Chewinga versus Carpenter in a track meet. Let's go. Incredible. That's incredible. I mean, <laughs> just full XFL shit. <laughs> Say it. <laughs> Do this. Like, I love it. Man, that one's a real mind bender. Carpenter, Chewinga. I, I, you know, that's that's got to be a push for me. I know I'm taking the, the total coward's way out, but I think like, <laughs> I kind of feel like it depends on. I mean, if we're talking about a straight track, yeah, I think it's a push. If we're talking about on the field, I think it kind of depends on the – like it's going to be one of those where a couple in a couple spots, Chewinga will get her. In a couple spots, Carpenter yeah. will, will kind of like catch up and, 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 and cut something off. really kind of depends on the angles once we're on yep. the pitch. But incredible mind bender. I hadn't even considered that, and that is just a little icing on the cake. It's gonna be some run and gun out there, Bubba. But let me mm-hmm. let me be serious here. Um, I think you're spot on with the PSG attack versus Leon's defense. I think that's probably the main event. If we go directly on the undercard, maybe it's a co-main event. I'm very interested to see PSG's midfield versus Leon's midfield. So in Lyon, you have Lindsay Horan, Daniela Van de Donk, Sarah Debritz, maybe Agarola, maybe Majerie, depending on how spicy Sonia Bonpastor is feeling that day. Going against PSG's midfield, Gayoro, Albert, maybe Vangsgaard, maybe Jackie Grunin. Manager Jocelyn Prashur has even put Karshawi in the midfield. When was one of the times I noticed that? Karshawi was in the defensive midfield against Lyon in that 1-1 draw in league play that you mentioned earlier. Mm. So maybe that's a look that we get to see. In that match, too, and you talk about what a banger that was. It still feel bad for Dale Almeida to have that kind of heartbreaker at the end. PSG had 55% possession in that match against Lyon. But at the same time, Lyon won the XG battle 1.2 to 0.8. So not a huge difference, but nearly half a goal difference in XG. So come on, man. I mean, I know I get my expectations up for these matches, for these kind of ties. I don't see it going any other way than this being a certified banger. Thousand percent cosine. And I think there's going to be, there's also the added little spiciness Mm-hmm. of the you know domestic rivalry and oh, yeah. the tough tough result like you mentioned seven matches ago for psg where they're just like oh my god I, you know i wouldn't be surprised to see them really come out and explode yeah and then i think either of these teams could fight back from i want to say kind of any deficit you know three might be tough but definitely two is sure is 100 percent workable but i think we're going to see the best from these two sides the best lineups 
We're going to see the best execution. This is going to be straight fireworks. The other semifinal, I think a lot of the same. Oh, yeah. Like Emma Hayes looking for a Champions League. You know, Hidalde's looking to kind of close his, his Barcelona chapter with another win with arguably the best roster on the planet right now. Yeah. And then I think these two French sides, you know, just sharpening each other up. All right, let's scoot ahead. Take a little dip into the news. Where do you want to get started? Snooze fucking sucks. Let's just get it out of the way. Uh, Mitch Purse on Wednesday, about 30 minutes before Leon Benfica kicked off, uh, Mitch Purse took to Twitter to announce that she had torn her ACL, uh, continuing the epidemic of ACL injuries uh, in women's football. This news is obviously, as I mentioned up top, this news really sucks, but especially for her. She was the MVP of the NWSL championship match last year. She's a brilliant player uh, with an incredible skill set. Uh, we'll all miss watching her play, but she is handling this with her typical grace. She took to Twitter to thank people for their messages of support, and she said, quote, Your messages have meant so much to me throughout this process. You have consoled what, for a moment, felt inconsolable. Thank you for reminding me that our football world is not only full with incredible talent, but also incredible kindness, end quote. I think it is very easy to say that we wish Midge a full and speedy recovery, but we also hope that... She continues to have that great support system around her to make this journey back to the pitch uh, as comfortable as it possibly can be. Awful news. Um, Not a lot of players I can think of that deserve kind of more kindness in that spot. And, you know, to say that we wish her a speedy recovery kind of feels like well short of the mark, you know, like this is just such a great player, such an inspirational player. So absolutely get well, Midge. See you soon. She'll be back, and you know she'll be great again. Uh, it just really, really sucks that she has to go through it. But, um, you know, she'll be watching the football right along with us. And tough to transition, but I do want to zoom into this She Believes Cup mm. US WNT roster. Obviously, a big midge purse size hole uh, in this roster, but, you know, that was announced here recently. The uh, She Believes Cup kicks off April 6th, which, if I'm doing my math right, is right around next weekend. Mm-hmm. The USA taking on Japan. A couple days later, the action will move to Columbus, Ohio, your old stomping grounds. Uh, and then the other, in the other nowhere matchup. near, nowhere near where I'm from. Ohio's a large <laughs> state, but that's okay. That's fine. Nobody cares. You know, if you're Norwegian, what do you know? Ohio's that's, Ohio. That's right. <laughs> in the other, in the other April 6th matchup going down in Atlanta, it's Canada versus Brazil. So uh, it's a little spicy collection of four teams that should bring some excitement next weekend. What stuck out to you? with the USA's roster. Hmm. Okay. Um, what stuck out? Gee, they announced, well, they announced the midfielders. Let me take a look here to make sure I have this right. Uh, scroll, okay. scroll, scroll, scroll. All right. So they had, uh, Corbin Albert from uh, PSG, Sam Coffey, uh, favorite of the program for the Portland Thorns, Lindsay Horan, obviously can't do it without oh, her. Good. Yep. Uh, Olivia Moultre, uh, yeah, good coming. young player. Yep, yeah. we love a up and coming young player. Emily Sana, crafty vet. Yeah, rock solid. Wait, do I have Lily Johannes, 16 year old wonder kid from AFC Ajax. That's what I'm talking about, buddy. We get to see her in the Stars and Stripes. As Dan announced on Twitter, as many media outlets were saying on Twitter, She Believes Cup is not a FIFA sanctioned tournament. This does not mm-hmm. tie her to the U.S. women's national team for international play moving forward. They're making their decision. You know, we're going to give them time as a family to decide what they want to do, what Lily wants to do, what's best for them. But Dan, if you could please excuse us. Fuck yes. This is good. She's going to be in the camp with the squad. She's going to be there with Twilight Kilgore. She's going to have Emma Hayes' influence on her in this in this tournament, in these couple of matches. She gets to see what life is like with our squad. And that is good. That's good for everybody involved, I think. Incredible for everyone involved. I mean, I just kind of rewind back probably like a dozen episodes ago mm. when you were just pleading with Emma Hayes, coach, we have to get this player. <laughs> yeah. And then a couple episodes later where I'm like, you know, kind of lamenting, all right, wh- where's our young superstar? You know, obviously we've seen a couple of players step up since then, Olivia Moutre, Jaden Shaw being a couple of them. Oh, yeah. And then you said, hey, buddy, maybe Lily Johannes is our Lily Johannes. <laughs> and now she's our Lily Johannes. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> she's on this USA side. I cannot wait. I hope she gets a little run. Oh, yeah. I think the midfield is kind of set up where it does make some sense on the pitch to kind of get her involved because she's got a very unique game. She's tough. She's physical. <laughs> and she's not afraid of big moments. 
I think this is the perfect place to kind of, you know, drop a player like that in uh, and kind of ingratiate her into the program. She obviously gets a little bit of camp time, which is great. No Emma Hayes time just yet, but I think, I don't know, hard to not be super duper encouraged if you are a USWNT fan or a follower like your boy is. Just a great day. Great news. Great day. I couldn't be more excited. You know, I love lineup and formation talk. Just, just riddle me this. Would you not like to see the midfield diamond sonnet? Bottom of the diamond, coffee out on the left, Johannes on the right, Haran up top. Oh my god. Let's go. Come on. That that's a nightmare. That's mm-hmm. a nightmare for for teams. You know, Japan, yeah, yeah, we're cute in the World Cup, but we throw that diamond at you. <laughs> They're very good. <laughs> I know, I'm just pressing. I love watching Japan too as well. All four of those teams, except Canada. No Mimi Aladu, like get out of your Canada. You don't you don't deserve to be on the same field as uh yeah, I think the other thing that I found interesting, you know, we've talked a lot about the 2023 World Cup rehashed. That went to death. 13 players on that World Cup roster who don't appear on the She Believes Cup roster. Mm. Some of them because of injury, some of them having aged out. Alana Cook, Savannah DeMello, Julia, Sofia Huerta, Aubrey Kingsbury, Rose Lavelle, Christy Mewis, Kelly O'Hara, Megan Rapino, Ashley Sanchez, Andy Sullivan, Alyssa Thompson, and this one her buddy, Lynn Williams. Yeah. Not on the She Believes Cup roster. Quite a bit of turnover. I like what the U.S has done i mean i feel like we have a more dynamic team it's more quick than fast you know if if that makes sense and it kind of feels like we're generating a new football identity uh in the u.s so i'm just kind of really excited i love it uh i think that's a great great call out is that they're almost more quick than fast um i want to just zip through their forwards real quick kat macario alex morgan trinity rodman Jaden shaw sophie smith uh real quick The women's game, the Men and Blazers podcast uh, hosted by Sam Mewis and Lynn Williams and uh, often Becky Sarbrun. Becky Sarbrun on like one of the last episodes mentioned that Sophie Smith doesn't like being called Sophia, that she either goes by Soph or Sophie. So, uh, Soph, our apologies there. We did, we were not aware of that. I don't know if that was like hugely public or if that she only thinks that about like people who are actually friends with her, like Becky Sarbrun. But yeah, I think I'll opt with Sophie. I think that works um, if she's comfortable with that. So like quick forwards, quick decisions. At this point, I feel like Trinity Rodman is a is a vet too. I mean, obviously Sophie Smith has has appeared in big matches too. Just veteran presence, young up and coming players, fast football, smart footballers. I think it's just safe to say that this is an incredible mix of talent and a great representation. That yeah, w- you know that past era was amazing. It's one of the greatest eras in in any football that's ever been played. But this this up and coming era, this is almost as exciting and it could actually be something that that lives up to that. Even if they even if they don't really have to live up to two consecutive World Cup wins. This is a team that's going to challenge for the World Cup as long as they are fit and in their prime. Yeah, no shots at all to um any previous generations, but no. you know, we've talked a lot about the game evolving and, you know, this is a reflection episode. I think this this squad reflects you know that evolution of the game quite well. Yep. To round out the rest of the roster defenders, Abby Dahl Kemper, Crystal Dunn, Tierna Davidson, Emily Fox, Eva Gaitino, who we saw score in Champions League recently, mm-hmm. Naomi Gurma, Casey Kruger, Jenna Nyswanger. I love I love the the collection stacked. of talent they put together. <laughs> Pretty stacked stacked roster. Trio of goalkeepers: Alyssa Nair, Casey Murphy, Jane Campbell. I'm excited. April six. Let's all kind of like lock in. Hopefully, we get a. You know, some lily minutes, and uh, we get to see this new look USWNT in action. It's going to be exciting, man. And, you know, we get we have the elite teams in there. Canada, Brazil, Japan, USA. Uh, should be in for a couple of uh, great matches, I would say. Absolutely. Anything else you want to hit before we get out of here? I think that's it, man. I think we, we spanned the globe and covered everything. All right, man. I think we did it. It's been another episode of Into the Channel. If you missed it, we broke down the four quarterfinal second leg matchups. Also dip a little toe into the semis. Quick preview on those. A little bit into the news. So remember, subscribe or follow into the channel, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you like to watch or listen at ITC underscore pod on X. Big thanks to you for watching, listening, subscribing, commenting, chiming in, or just playing rocking with us. We appreciate you. Still a lot of Champions League action to go. We are super pumped. Tremendous ride thus far. And um, some epic, epic clashes on the horizon. And we hope that you continue to hang out with us. Big thank you to my co-host as well, Mr. Grant Engel, for always finding a way to advance. You know, man, I'm trying out here. We got 
Champions League, NWSL, D1F is coming to its conclusion. She believes Cup and roster decisions being made. It's the greatest sport in the world. I don't think there's any debate on that. We appreciate you guys all rocking with us, uh, informing us in the comments. Please keep it coming, and we will talk to you next week. <laughs>